everybody. I hope everybody's safe and well. I hope everybody's doing all right at home. And I hope you're all coping with what's going on. I mean, I know I'm doing this video about me, but, you know, every one of you has got, to, every single person that watches this, well, you know, you've got your own issues, so I hope you're doing all right. I mean, when it comes to something like this, sometimes it ain't all about money. Here we go, somebody doing their garden. <clears throat> we was just saying yesterday, we're gonna look out the window and this is gonna be, everybody along here is gonna be the most best kept gardens everywhere, even where you are, we're gonna be the best kept gardens in the country now, isn't it? Because everybody's got nothing else to do. Except do a little bit of work in the garden. Done a bit of work in my garden for three or four days. I needed it. I needed to switch off for a few days. I needed to just close the world off for a few days. And, uh, and just, oh, shut up. There's not been a sound out here all morning, not a sound. There's no denying I've been a bit on the downside. I mean, I've been pretty down all weekend, even though I've been working in the garden. I'm now trying to speak in between these bursts on the old trimmer. So I'm gonna keep clipping the video, cutting it. <laughs> Oh, God, what a load of bollocks. So, you want to know what's happening? I haven't got a clue. I don't know what I'm doing. That's the worst position for me ever to be in. I don't know what I'm doing. The only thing I know right now is that taking the view to be absolutely straight and honest, insolvency, issues, wasn't the best move to make. And I'll tell you for why. The reason is, when you, by being honest, and letting everybody know what was happening, as transparently as possible, and keeping everybody in the picture as much as I possibly could ended up backfiring on me. And there's a good reason why businesses, when they get into financial trouble, are not honest and straightforward. You know, there's a reason why all of a sudden, out of the blue, you find out that Debenhams or Woolworths or some such has gone bust overnight. Whether they've got three employees, 30 employees, 300 employees or 3,000 employees. People don't do, businesses don't do what I chose to do. That was a really big gamble I took. Huge gamble. To actually go to the people yeah. that invest in you and put money into you and buy from you and work with you. To go to all of those people and to actually level with everybody and go, this is the way it is. We ain't got long left. And if we don't turn things around, we're gonna go under. And then you have this, you, you know, that's why you don't get any of that. You don't get any of all of this going on in order to avoid going into receivership. So you find out overnight and everybody finds out overnight that they haven't got a job. That's the way it's done. And it's done like that for a very good reason. Traditionally, what will happen is your employees will start looking for another job if you, if you tell them the truth. No matter who you are, 
And it doesn't matter what kind of business you've got. The moment the people that are on PAYE that rely on coming in every day for their weekly wage and their daily bread and their rent and their shopping and their Tesco's and anything else that they buy. The moment you level with anybody and tell them that you're on the way out. One of the things that, that those employees will do is they will look for another job. You can't stop people doing that. You can try, but you can't stop people doing that. It's natural, because we all have to look after number one. Because when you're an employee, you're, you're tied to the business. It's not generally, I say generally, not always, the same as, say, the people that own it. That sounds like I'm putting a lot on employees. I'm not, I'm just saying about the way things go and why they go that way. So that's one of the reasons why a business will never ever tell you, the employees or the people that are working with it and for it, the, the real truth and level with people is because one of the first things to happen, and it doesn't matter who those employees are, whether they are the top of the tree or the bottom of the tree, it doesn't make any difference people will start looking for another job. They've got to look after number one. Now, the moment they start doing that, they're taking attention away from A, their job that they're doing, and B, your business. Attention is being taken away. Whether that's 5%, 10%, 20%, 50%, whatever, attention is being taken away. So you have that issue to deal with. So for me, to be completely honest, uh, was an anomaly. And, uh, and something that neither Logan or John, I don't think, or Kelly or any of the people that help us remotely that, that don't work from here, I don't think that's anything that any of those people had ever had happen to them before. I think that was a completely new thing to have happened to them. And then we come to customers and investors. So again, I'll use the the, the example of of Debenhams and places like that, right? If I was running Debenhams, there's no way that I would have announced insolvency overnight. I would try everything in the book to raise money. And there are things that could have been done. But things are being made easier now for the people at the top. It's being made easier for people to go under and businesses like Bright House and Debenhams to go under without the same thing happening to the Guinness directors, without them going to prison, without them getting their knuckles wrapped. But still, I would have thought differently. However, the point is that I'm trying to make is the last thing in the world people are going to do is invest into something that's going downhill. And so what happens is, and say what happens, what's happened in our case, and I can only, and going by everything I've ever learned in business and self-employment and working for 50 years and supply and demand and everything else. I've learned that that everybody likes to crowd around something that looks good. So, you know, the business that's taking off is the one that everybody wants to be part of, right? The most, the most confident and handsome or beautiful girl in the school is the one that everybody wants to, to, to be friends with. And nobody wants to be friends or support businesses that don't look like they're going anywhere. And so people will, you can say quite rightly, won't invest 
in something that's going downhill. Therefore, when I put out a call for help, and I kept saying over and over and over again, if you've got investments, if you've got investments, protect those investments, help me, do something, I don't know, do something. Put something in, help keep me afloat, one way or another, but whatever you do, don't let me go under. And I kept saying that over and over and over and over again. And, and there were people that listened to that, but a small percentage. So out of the people that have the money to actually help us get out of it or help sustain us or whatever, whichever way you want to put it, a very, very small percentage of those people that have got the money actually want to help and put it in. And I don't blame the ones that didn't. I don't blame you at all. Because, like I say, people get frightened and worried and don't think it's a good idea to put money into a business that is going downhill at, at, at a rate of knots. And out of the small percentage of the people that did want to help me and put in and continue to fight and so on and so forth, the amount of money coming in from those people just wasn't enough. I mean, it got to a point where it was all about the money and it just wasn't enough. And again, blame anybody for that. That is the way that it is. And, and, and it will always be that way. And the only anomalies to that are places like Amazon. I remember the Amazon story very, very well. Amazon were losing an absolute fortune a fortune. They used to lose around between 10 and $20, right, on every single book. Every book you bought off them. Well, not every single book, but a lot. Because their model was a simple one, you know, let's advertise every book there ever is from every distributor everywhere. Let's advertise every single book, every single record, every single thing for sale. That way we're going to get loads and loads of business. Great idea. And they did that. And so they, they stock stuff, but they also uh, drop ship. So they would, you know, drop ship or they would order it directly from the distributor. So I sell a book, I'm Amazon, I sell a book for, for, for $15, right? I then buy that book and order it off of my supplier. The supplier sends me that book through the post, which I'm paying for. Postage on a book is not cheap. He sends me that book. I then, as Amazon, get that book in, take it out of its packet, repackage it into Amazon packaging, which costs money, and then send that off to you, the customer. Now, the whole process on that sometimes costs more than what they actually got for the book. It might cost them 20 or $30, but they, you know the book was only 15 And they were losing money hand over fist. I mean, when I say hand over fist, I'm talking, you know, 10 to $20 million every quarter, every three months they was losing. You're sitting there thinking, Ian, you're talking out the back of your backside. It's not possible. They wouldn't still be in business. It's the truth. And it can, you can check it. It's the truth. But it just happened. It was lucky. It happened to coincide with a dot-com boom. And so the dot-com boom, people started investing. People like you and me, people like average, ordinary people were able to invest in the dot-com boom, as well as all these investment places, left, right and centre. Pension pots and all the rest of it. And so money kept pouring in to Amazon. People kept buying the shares and the shares kept going up in price, even though their profits or losses kept, well, the losses were massive and the profits going down, but the costs going up to the point where they were losing 10 to 20, uh, 10 to 20 million dollars a quarter. And the only reason that Amazon was able to do that 
because it, it, it produced quarterly accounts that said it was losing a phenomenal amount of money, but people kept buying into it. And that is the only reason it survived. They kept buying into it. It didn't matter that it was losing money. It didn't matter about all of that. All that mattered was their customer base seemed to be growing, they seemed to be growing. Let's just keep buying and buying and buying. And so people did. They just kept buying and buying and putting more money in. Well, what that means is, I mean, Amazon essentially traded insolvently. They were bankrupt. They, they were at the cleaners, right? But because the money kept coming in through the letterbox, as it were, and it kept coming in, it meant that the money that was coming in could be used to stave off the creditors that they owe too much to or they've been waiting too long or whatever. So there's always this massive debt and the massive debt is building and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And bigger. But the money that's coming in is enough to just stave it all off, stave it all off, stave it all off. Until they got to a point where they actually the losses that they were making started shrinking. And then the losses that they made, were making were shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And, and then, you know, people started making money. But for a long, long time, they were bust. They were finished. But they managed to keep going. And I understand that principle. Oh my God, do I understand that principle so well. And I can't tell you how many times I read that book where I got the information from over and over and over again to understand it. And I do understand it. And if I could keep enough money coming in through that letterbox, that's all I need to do is to keep that money coming in through the letterbox long enough be able to keep paying off what I've got to pay, what I've got to pay, what I've got to pay, long enough to get that huge problem decreased. Now, for me, there's only two real ways I can do that. One is to do what Amazon did and trade my way out of it, but, you know, Let's put things into perspective here, just a little tad. I mean, we're talking about just me, Ian Lambert, and John, half of John, poor sod, because he's not too well, hasn't been for a long, long time. So you've got sort of, and I'm not even a whole one, let's face it. So between the two of us, really, you know, because neither of us are, uh, are really healthy enough to to put in a full day's work. I can't even start work until after half 10, 10 o'clock every, every day. He has similar issues. So between the two of us, you know, we're probably like one person between the two of us. So we've got one person, call it one person, trying desperately to keep it all together and do the work of three or four. And, uh, and that becomes uh, difficult to do. But still, the principle, so the two ways of me getting back on, of being able to do exactly that, to do the Amazon thing. One is to trade my way out of it, like Amazon, but that's gonna be extremely difficult to do, as I say, because, you know, it's just one person between the two of us. And then the other thing to do the only other way that I'm going to get back on, out of this, or trade my way out of this, if it's not trading my way out of it, is literally going to be the taking them to court, the legal action. Because let's face it, there ain't nothing else, is there? Let's discount winning the lottery for now. Let's just try and keep things within the realms of sense and sensibilities. So, unless I trade my way out of it, or unless I take them to court, there is absolutely no way everybody, you, every single investor, whether you, whether I owe you one coin or I, whether I owe you 60 grand, whatever I owe you, there is no chance of a, 
of getting that paid off without trading through it or taking them to court. Now, in order to trade through it, I'm going to need money and I'm going to need to reinvent our entire business over the next few months. Because the one thing that I cannot do is I cannot go back to selling one single coin at a time. That's, that's me finished. Seven years of hard graft, seven years of work out the window, gone. That will never happen again. I'm 56 years old. John is 66 years old. He's 10 years older than me. Stage four lung cancer. You know, he's, that's, not, that's not the only thing that's wrong with him. He's ill. I'm not going to list my complaints. I'm ill. So, so the thought of going back to selling one coin at a time, I can't see that happening. I just can't see it happening. The amount of work involved doing what we were doing. I mean, not counting all of those people out there, you know. I mean, let's just go for a little bit of it, right? Selling one coin at a time involves me, John, a Logan, a Kelly. So that's four people's wages. Right, you've got to sell a lot of coins, a lot of individual coins to pay for people's wages. Then you've got people like Mick doing the newsletter. And you have uh, other people working on things like Katie on the uh, Instagram and Chris and Lorna that help us out with, um, with the moderating and uh, and there's lots of other things that they do besides that, by the way. Let me tell you, they do other work behind the scenes that nobody knows about. Uh, same with Lisa, you know. There's, there's people that work for us, Richard. There's people that work for us, Butch, you know, all do work that some of you know about, and they, uh, but they all do a lot of work that none of you know about. None of you know that they're doing this and that and this and that. But you add up all of the hours all of the minutes and all of the hours spent by all of these people. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a phenomenal amount of work that's being done. <clears throat> all to sell one coin at a time. To go back to doing that, to seriously, I mean, we need to have this conversation because for me to go back to doing that, you know, we would need to employ at some point another Kelly and another Logan. Right? I mean, one or may of them might want to come back. Who knows? You know, we, we would have to cross that point when we come to it. But the fact remains that, 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 that we would need a Kelly and a Logan in order to do all of that work. Or we reinvent ourselves and go down a wholesale route and and go down a different route. I don't know what other kind of route, but a different route to what we were doing. Something that involves parcels and not individual packets. Something that takes away the individual posting, the sitting down at a desk and individually wrapping 100 or 200 little packages in a day. Go down to a point where we're just doing parcels or something. That would be one way of coming back into the game as this virus closes and we can get back into it. It would be one way of us getting back into the game before the virus closes, because the one thing I can do now is I can wrap and pack a parcel. I can call a courier, have it picked up from the door and delivered to the customer. So I can do posting. I just can't do individual posting and don't want to. That is another thing. I don't want to do it. I don't want to sit there wrapping and packing 100 to 200 little packages a day. Now, someone might go, well, don't be so lazy, and it's not a question of that. Well, it is, but it, but it also isn't. You know, while I'm doing that, I can't do other things. I can't, I can't come and do me updates. I can't talk to anybody on the phone. I can't answer the emails. I can't, I can't, I can't do six jobs all at the same time. So we have to get sensible about this, you know? We have to get sensible about what we're going to do and 
how we're going to do it. Excuse me. So, where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in a situation. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's, that's the one thing. One thing is trading your way out of it. The other, the other is taking them to court. Now, taking them to court, the price I put on that is £10,000 a day, going back to November 2017. Call me an idiot if you like. I don't care. You have to have a figure. And I base my figure on one single coin. Now, if a forensic accountant came along and we won the case and they said, but we don't go by your figures, Mr Lambert, what we're going to do is forensically account it and we're going to work out how much money you really would have lost, then it will come to a horrifying figure above that. My figure of 10 grand a day is quite conservative, let me tell you based on one single solitary coin, based on a Stephen Hawkins. So, taking them to court is, is, is the only other, so selling, getting back into selling needs to be the kind of selling where I can easily manage it between me and John as a, as a one whole person between two knackered hearts. So it needs to be easily controlled and easily managed. We ain't going to do that with a huge database of customers. We're going to have to scale the database of customers down by not selling individual coins, let other people do that. There are people that have got access to stamps and a post box right outside the house. So there are people that are going to be able to do that kind of stuff, you know? I'm just not able. So, um, So there we are. So there's, there's our two choices, isn't it, really? Our two choices are to try and trade your way out of it or to take them to court. Now, to trade my way out of it and get to a point where I am up to date with my bills and up to date with the investors and all the money I've got to pay out, that it's going to take a fair bit of trading. I'm not saying I'm not up to the task. I'm up to the task. I don't mind working. I don't mind working and working through it and working to pay it all off. I don't mind. I, I would prefer to do that. But it's going to take some time. That ain't going to happen in three months. I mean, we were getting to a point where I thought I would be back out of danger come the summer. And again, I'm not blaming the virus, but, you know, the virus stops me doing that. The virus stops me doing a lot. There's other things this virus stops me doing. So there we are. So we're faced with, you work your way out of it or you take and record on me. So now, it, so now we've got two things that can get us all out of trouble. Two things that can get everybody paid off. And both of those two things need more money through that letterbox. Trading your way out of it can't be done if I don't get more money through the letterbox. I've got to, I've got to change an awful lot about the business. Every list, I mean, you know, if, even if I got the shop back, the website back, everything on there would have to come off. Everything would have to be repriced, relisted. A phenomenal, phenomenal job. It took seven years to put all the listings we've got up there. You know, we'd, we'd list every day. Phenomenal job. But trading your way out of it, money for the letterbox. Taking them to court, money for the letterbox. Now, if the people, whoever it is, stops putting money through that letterbox, that's it. For a business that is in that position, that's it. If the money stops coming in through that letterbox, you are beat instantly, boom, overnight. If at any point, any point whatsoever, the money stopped coming in through that letterbox, Amazon would have been beat, finished. There would be no Amazon. I know it's hard to imagine, but there would be no Amazon. People believed in it enough. 
don't ask me why they, why people kept putting money into the business when it was losing 10 to 20 million dollars every three months, I couldn't tell you. But I can tell you, that is exactly what happened. And that is the only reason that Amazon managed to trade through it. And there are other companies like Amazon. That is the only reason they managed to trade through it. And that is the only reason that they are, are here today. And the only way I am going to stay is if I get money continually coming through that letterbox one way or another which is why I come up with every idea I can think of because I know the money must not stop coming in through that letterbox if it does we're done and then I have the embarrassment of saying we're done now coming back to what I said earlier on about letting everybody know, running transparent and all the rest of it. It's, it's extremely rare a business can be straight and say, we're going downhill, I need you to invest more money. And so by being honest and by being transparent, about the entire process, and I will continue to be. Um, it shot me in the foot. And it probably has turned into the single worst mistake that I've made. Probably should not have leveled with everybody and should have kept a front up. I know this sounds like bullshit, but it's true. You know, you have to keep the front up. You have to keep up that front. You have to let all your employees think that they, their job is secure. You have to let all the investors think that their money is secure. You have to let everybody that you owe money to think that it's secure. And that involves a level of bullshit. And that involves a level of lying. And that involves a level of, you know, although some people in business, if you put it in a courtroom, would say, oh, no, it's not lying. It's just putting a spin on it. But that is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to put a spin on it. You're supposed to keep everybody in the dark because that money's got to keep coming in through the letterbox and the work's got to keep getting done and you need 100% focus. So the whole, the whole root of that, the whole decision of going, I'm going to do this in a straight, clear, transparent and honest way, bit me on the ass. Some of you appreciated it. Some of you didn't like it. And, uh, and some of you appreciated it and wanted to be able to help but couldn't afford to. And some of you appreciated it and wanted to be able to help and did. And, uh, and unfortunately, not enough did. And so because not enough people did and not enough people believed, that's what it has to be about, isn't it? It's got to be about belief. If you believe, you back. If you don't believe, you don't back. If you believe, you back. You don't put money on a horse believing the horse will lose. Who does that? Think about it. You put money on a horse you think will win. That's why we have the favourite and that's why the favourite is always the lowest dodge. Because it's the one everybody thinks is going to win, so that's the one that everybody puts their money on. And people ain't putting their money on this horse, not in enough quantity, not in their droves, because those people don't believe in this horse. And it's an old and knackered horse. Let's face it. <laughs> I've lost all my vitality. The only thing I've got left is my sexy good looks. You know? I mean, I'll probably be able to get away with making a few quid doing the oil of you lay and everything because I'm so handsome. But other than that, I don't know. So that's where we are. 
and uh, and again in this route that I took and the trouble with that route is I can't now change my mind I can't now go oops this was this was this was not a good path to take let, let me go back let's go down that other path the other path where I pretend there's nothing wrong can't do that now can't go down the road of bullshit and bollocks now because you know it's either you the bullshit and the bollocks is or it's either transparency and I went down the road of transparency and now I've got to continue with that and I will but that also means that I will get less backers you know. and if you stick an horse in the race that's a bit lame Who's going to back that? So we have to understand this, but you also have to understand some of you also have to understand that that because I didn't get enough backing I couldn't sustain it. When it all went wonky to the nth degree, I couldn't sustain it. The moment the virus hit, and they told us all stay at home, that was it, that was us done, really. You know, and all I'm doing is, is I'm trying to flog a dead horse. So, um, so that's where it leaves us. Now, another problem I've got is doing the lives. And Fran has to take priority over me because we now, we, we only have, we don't have business internet here. We only have ordinary internet. And like everywhere else, like you, the internet use has gone up around where I live. So there's more drain on the service. And as you know, I, when I go on and do the lives on the YouTube and that sometimes it freezes up on me and one thing and another and that's just me using it. So with Fran, because she's a therapist and she deals with her clients in her office on uh, on video. The two of us using the video at the same time. And she can't have that. So, so we've got to try and organise when we're going to both be using it. So I will be coming back to the lives. It might be tomorrow. I, I, I don't know yet. Um, I mean, is any is any any point in me coming back to the lives if there's if there's people that are there that want me to come back to the lives? It sounds a bit funny, but you know, if I end up going on and taking up two hours to do a live and I'm only speaking to say ten or twenty people, it may not be worth doing. And you know, and you might. You might also agree with that. You might want to say, look, Ian, there's nobody interested, so let's call it a day. Uh, and that's fair enough. So we've got to see how it goes. And uh, meanwhile, I can continue talking to you and doing these updates, because that I can just, you know, I'll try and cut this to bits to make sure it's as short as I can, and then I'll, I'll, um, so, it, no, it should be spliced up, this. Um, I'll carry on coming back on and letting everybody know, what, everybody know what's going on. I mean, you know, you've got my number, so you can text me. Uh, don't bombard us with emails because they're not being answered. And uh, I'm not even getting around to answering all of my messages. So when I say you've got my number, you know, that's the wrong thing to say actually, because I don't want people, I don't want thousands of people contacting me. Otherwise I'm gonna spend all day trying to answer messages on my phone. Um, you know, if it's, uh, if you want to talk to me about a refund of any kind, then the only way, the only place to talk to me about that will be when I do the lives. And I will be doing some lives but first of all, as I said, the next person I'm going to be sorting out is Nanny Sue, and I haven't done that yet, because um, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do it. It's all right when I owe people 20 or 30 quid or whatever, I can 
that's easy. When you start getting into big money or, or, or higher amounts of money, then, you know, I need to try and come up with something that's going to make the people happy. So at the end of the day, you want people to still walk away from you happy. Don't you? I do anyway. So uh, there's no point texting me or phoning me to talk about refunds. There's no point phoning me or texting me to put the pressure on. We've already started receiving emails. I mean, the emails still get through, even though you get an automatic responder, but there is nobody answering your emails. Uh, so John is doing it very sporadically, and he's only answering the really, really, if something's, you know, then, then he's got to deal with it. But if it's just somebody asking for a refund, then he's not, not at a minute. <coughs> and he can't. <coughs> Over and above, whatever it is that I offer, we are legally obliged in certain areas that we can't. You can't make people preferential creditors. I am doing that, but I'm doing that in a way that I think I might be able to do the same thing for everybody. Because when you, when you get into this kind of a situation, it is a one-size-fits-all. What I offer you, I have to offer everybody else. What I offer that person, I have to offer you. Everybody gets the same. So if I give somebody 50p in the pound, everybody has to be offered 50p in the pound. Everybody. So, you know, messages that are coming through, and I sympathise, don't think I don't, not for a second, but messages coming through, letting us know that families are in trouble, letting us know that the coronavirus is, you know, you've got no money and you need to do shopping and one thing and another. There's not a lot I can do about that. Even if I had the money, just the amount of money to pay your one so that you could get that shopping, that would be a criminal act for me to do that. And for that, I'll go to prison. I went to prison for that before. I went to prison for doing the right thing. That's why I said, you know, and there's a video nobody wanted to watch. That really surprised me. The one I, I titled, you know, there's the legal, there's the right, and there's the moral thing to do. And that video, I would have thought a lot of people would watch, but nobody was interested in that. Well, at the time, Nobody's interested in that. I don't know what the figures are now on it. You know, there are things that you can, that you know are going to get you in trouble. And I start making preferential creditors from a cash point of view. I'm going to prison. I know it. And I'm not going to... I'll take a bit of a risk. I'll go close to the wire. I'll do what I can in every way possible. But I won't knowingly do something that I absolutely know will put me in prison. Doing what I'm doing with the customers that are owed money for goods and things like that, I think I can get away with that. I think that is going really close to the wire and I think I can get away with that. And I could hold my head up and, 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 and have a debate or, or, or an argument with a solicitor or a judge if it ever came to it. I think I'd be all right with that. Making people cash payments when there is no money to pay any business bills, when there is no money to offer anybody anything. When I say that, because you have to offer it to everybody, remember? Uh, that would be an absolute criminal offence. Not only would I go to prison for it, but when caught, so would the person I gave the money to. They'd be going to prison. I got six months for that. You are going to prison, Mr Lambert, and you're going to prison for six months. And no, we're not interested in anything you've got to say. Boom. Down come the gravel. The hammer. And that was booked for four days, that trial. Four days. Evidence. I was bringing evidence. And all, no, we're not interested in anything you've got to say, Mr Lambert. This is not going to be a four-day trial. This is going to be done today. You are going to prison, and you're going to prison for six months. Bang. I'll never forget that. You are going to prison, and you're going to prison for six months. Bang. 
<clears throat> have we got to a point where it's too late? No. It's only too late when it's too late. It is too late now, to a degree, but it ain't too late. If somebody phoned me up and said, I, wanted, I want to put 20 grand into, like I did have a customer, that, but he, that person was waiting to sell their house. Now, that ain't going to happen now. You know, so we had a silver lining because somebody was going to put 25 grand in. And I know that wasn't a load of old bollocks. That was straight up happening because that person absolutely believes that we are going to win the court case. So much so that he want, he's going to put 20 grand into the court case and five grand into a normal investment. But £20,000 was going into the 10 times the mint court case fund because he believes he will get back £200,000. He believes that we will win. Now, if his house sold yesterday and, and his money comes through today, oh, different story. But that's not going to happen, is it? Come on, let's be serious. But let's be, you know, common sense here. The virus is now it. Nobody wants to buy a house. We've got the biggest house price crash. The biggest house price crash pardon me, in history about to happen. Probably the biggest stock market crash in history about to happen. It's all coming. The things that are coming now are things that you can't imagine. There are teams of people employed head to toe in protective gear to do nothing else but go around collecting dead bodies. That is their job now. Everybody's been sent home to die. You've all been sent home to die. I've been sent home. Everybody's been sent home to die because our National Health Service can't take it. It ain't going to take the strain. And so everybody's just got to go home, stop mixing up the virus, stop giving each other the virus, just go home. We need everybody to go home for a month and then a load of people will drop like flies. Those people need dealing with and getting rid of. Everybody that's left behind, well, they're obviously immune or they ain't gonna catch it or whatever, or they've got a better chance. The National Health Service staff, the doctors and the nurses that are dying and that are dropping like flies are not being added to the daily statistics. They announced 5,000 people dead in this country. That's bollocks. There's at least 10,000 people dead in this country, at least right now at least 10,000 dead anyway I'm digressing again but it's all part of it, isn't it? It's, why we, it's, it's part of why we we are at where we are at it's partly why we're here it's partly why I'm here the virus was not the cause of my business going under Or it wasn't the cause of my business going, that's better by putting it, it's, it, the virus is not the cause of my business taking a downward spiral. But it is the nail in the coffin. And without the extra money, it is, that's, that's, that's the last nail in the coffin. With extra money, it's a nail in the coffin a nail in the coffin. Coffin ain't nailed shut yet with the money. Without the money, that is the last nail in the coffin. Gone, done. So unless somebody rings me up tomorrow and says, Ian, I'm gonna put 30 grand in and someone else rings me up and says, Ian, I'm gonna put 10 grand in or 20 grand in or somehow, some way I can manage to raise whatever I need, we're done. And being done means I have to accept it. It's the hardest thing for me right now is accepting it. I mean properly accepting it. Accepting the fact that we're done. Accepting the fact that there is no point in me trying to pay the Shopify bill because it's only going to go anyway. There's no point in me trying to pay a tax bill. 
Might as well go in anyway. There's no point in me paying anything now. The only things that I can, I, I need to legally pay now are the things that will legally keep me going in whichever format. That, that, that's all I can legally pay. I can't pay anything that is outside of that. Not without money through letterbox. So we've come to a grinding all. And again, I don't blame anybody but me. It's my fault. I'm the one who took the bloody risk. It's my stupid fault. And that even makes me sound pathetic. Apologising for the fact that I tell you the truth. And I've levelled with you. But it isn't the right way to do business. It's not. There's a reason why people haven't done that for centuries. There's a reason why thousands and thousands and thousands of businesses don't do that. And, and I went against the grain on that. And it bit me on the arse severely because it is not the way to do business. The way to do business is... The stiff upper lip, the way I do business, is the pretense that everything is all right until it's not, and then just go overnight. Anyway, <clears throat> I won't drone on any longer. I think I've rabbited on far too long. It's going to take me a couple of hours just to flip in, cut this about now. Um, I ain't going anywhere. I won't be killing myself. I won't pretend that I don't have suicidal thoughts. Oh, by Christ, do I. And it's hard not to have those thoughts come into your head. I often say, you know, when I've talked to Fran, I say to her, yeah, I know, but I can't stop those thoughts coming into my head. How do you stop a thought appearing in your head? It's there. So I do get the thoughts. But more from a I can talk about it point of view, I could have the conversation with nearest and dearest and I could talk to somebody else because I know I've got no intention of going out and I will not go out and kill myself. I just know I'm having those suicidal thoughts. But there are a lot of people out there that they find it difficult to separate that out. And so because it's coming in, they'll end up going and doing it. And that's going to be such a shame. So many people are under a lot of pressure right now, and they are going to do it. So, no, that's not going to happen to me. I'm still going to be here. I'll still fight my way through. I'll f and I will always look to try and find a way, no matter what it is, you know. I mean, maybe I'll sit down and write a book, and maybe that book will sell. At the moment, I have no confidence in anything whatsoever to do with me because it feels like none of the ideas I've put time and effort into are working. And I just, in my water, in my sinews, in every of my body, I just feel that there are certain ideas I've come up with. They are rip-roaring ideas. They are really good ideas. I just can't, I can't take them to where they need to be. And at the moment, I don't know what else to do. And that's the bit I hate more than anything, is not knowing what to do next. As long as I can think of something to do, I've, it's like I've got reason to fight, see? As I can keep coming up with ideas, and if people buy into those ideas, then I've got a reason to fight. If I keep coming up with the ideas and nobody wants to buy into them ideas, then there's no, there's no reason to fight, is there? I was just call it a day. So there is something else to tell you. Sorry to go on. There is something else to tell you. <clears throat> the only other thing that was left open to me was trying to... Um, trying to... fight on Facebook. So I picked, I've been picking posts, and as you know, I've been setting up this thing about giving people a parcel to share a, to share a post in order to get the publicity going and keep the publicity going so that, you know, maybe something at the end of it. Anyway, the long and short of it is, no matter what I try and do, all the accounts I've got are blocked. 
The other day, I got my personal account back. I went onto Facebook. I shared a post to a group. It posted. I shared to another group. It's only two, right? Two. Shared to another group. Account blocked. So, I'm getting beat on Facebook. The posts that I'm putting up on Facebook... Once they start getting a lot of attention, I've been getting deleted. Yeah, you work that one out. So the Ostermate video that's attracted 15,000 views, deleted. It's not there. I think there is a copy of it on Facebook, but the, but the actual post that had been shared so many times, it's got 15,000 views on it that post is gone and a post that Chris was working on that he managed to get over a thousand shares on it that post is gone deleted we set up a coronavirus group uh, Butch and I and one of the things that we wanted to do on that group was to be able to get help people for shopping because we could see all this coming with the shopping that was deleted Posts within it deleted, the group was deleted. So, now I see it. <clears throat> Someone else might say, yeah, but you share too much on Facebook and you always push the thing and then, and then, and then, yeah, they're so they blocked you, you deserve it. All right. Yeah, you could take that view. I think I take the view that I've got a basic human right to do everything that I can legally and morally to save my business. And if that means going onto Facebook and joining a hundred groups and then making a post and sharing that post to a hundred groups to try and save my business. I think I've got a legal, a legal and a human right to do that. I believe I have. And if Facebook allow me to join a hundred groups, then how can they be annoyed if I share a post to the hundred groups that they've allowed me to join? If you don't want people to do that, then make it clear and succinct. A person can only join more, no more than X amount of groups. You can only do X amount of posts per day. You need to have those kind of rules in place, right? So people know what they can do. If I know I can only share to 39 groups a day, I will share to 39 groups a day. But don't make it so that someone else can share to 50 groups in a day and I can only share to 30. That ain't right. Or I can only share to two. That ain't right. I've got a legal and, and human right, a basic human right, I see it, to save my bloody business. I've got a basic human right. It is my basic human right to set up a group page if I want to help people so that they can, they can put links about where they can all buy shopping. I think I've got the right to do that. The, the, the social media marketplace of Facebook is there for 13 years of age and over. And there is not a single post that I have put up or a single share that I have put up that could offend or be wrong for someone of 13 years and old over to watch. The only video that I think that they shouldn't watch, that I've done and put up, would be the one where I completely lost the plot that night and said some naughty words. Other than that, I defy anybody to say to me that any of the content that I've put up or shared cannot, should not, be viewed by someone 13 years or old, over. Why am I making such a big thing of that? Because because I feel a bit aggrieved at having my Ostermate video taken down when you can find all the hardcore pornography that you can think of. No matter what you want to watch, hardcore porn, animals, treating animals badly, treating people badly, domestic abuse, child abuse, animal abuse, all of this stuff. Oh, there's videos for it. There's posts for it on Facebook. You want to see hardcore pornography? Serious hardcore pornography? 
It's on Facebook. You don't have to go to Google. It's on Facebook. It is covered in porn and hate crime and hate speech and animal rights violations and human rights violations and children's rights violations and all other kind of rights violations. It is full of it. But somehow or other, this pillock is, is doing something wrong and is not allowed to fight for his business on Facebook. Because every time I do, I'm constantly blocked, constantly blocked. I've been blocked for another week. I got it back. I was blocked 10 minutes later. Now my pages are getting blocked from posting. So Facebook is turning into a dictatorial state. It's turning into... Again, you're going to think I'm off my tits, but, you know, George Orwell, 1984. You think, well, that doesn't quite equate to our society. It doesn't, but it does equate to the Chinese and communistic society. That is virtual 1984. We have Big Brother everywhere. 1984, bloody everywhere. And now, now, now it's not the governments that are going to be controlling our lives. It's not the governments, as George Orwell saw it, that's going to be controlling direct what you watch, what you see who you talk to, what you say. No, it will be the social media that will be controlling everything that we see and everything that we do and what we say. And that will be at the behest of the governments who pay them. Facebook knows everything about me, everything about you. It knows absolutely everything. And there is nothing we can do to demonstrate against that, to protest against that. The only thing you can do to protest against it is to come off Facebook. But it doesn't solve the problem of Facebook knowing absolutely everything. Why does that make a difference? It makes a difference because it, mean, it means that we are, those of us that are not sure, not sure which way to jump, shall I go there or shall I go there? It means we're up for sale. It means our thoughts are up for sale. Because if we're not sure whether to do that or whether to do that, and Facebook knows we're not sure whether to do that or whether to do that, whichever one of those people pays Facebook the most money is the people that are going to get seen by us, me, who's not sure which way to go. So if I don't know whether to do A or whether to do B, I don't know whether to vote Labour, I don't know whether to vote Liberal. Hmm, what shall I do? What shall I do? What's the man got to do? B comes along, says to Facebook, I'll give you more money than A to put my advert in front of Ian Lambert and then he'll pick me. That means I've just been bought and sold. My faults, my actions, what I'm going to do is being bought and sold, no different to a slave, by somebody else earning money out of it. And Facebook are earning absolutely trillions, billions out of this. The fact that I like that TV programme and I like, I like Bungle's post, and I like this, and I like that. It's all recorded, every single thing, every word, every sentence, every way you say the sentence. There are algorithms that decide, work out the way that we talk in the sentences that we write. And it's all to make money. So I'm going to protest against that. So I'm telling you now, everybody, don't pay any attention to my Facebook. Because my Facebook is going to be, is going to see some shit on it, I tell you. I'm going to like conservatives. I'm going to share posts from the conservatives. I'm going to share posts from the liberals. I'm going to share posts from the Labour. I'll share posts from anybody but a racist or a supremacist. I can't go that far. But I'm going to buck up the, the algorithms. I'm going to make it so that the one thing Facebook ain't going to do, the bastards, is they ain't going to make a single penny out of me. Because all the adverts they're going to be showing me are all going to be adverts of shit I don't want and don't like and not interested in. But I'm clicking the like button on the lot. Whatever Facebook recommends, I'm clicking the like button. What they don't recommend, I'm clicking the like button. It's the only way I can bloody protest. It's an individual level. But it means, for me personally, Facebook is not...
going to earn any money out of me and it is not going to treat me like some kind of slave. And it is, I am not for sale to anybody. Not Facebook, not anybody. I'm me, I'm my own person. I ain't for sale. And I did not like finding out about that. Watch some Facebook documentaries, different people that have made them, BBC, Sky News. Look around for them, try and watch them, see what they're doing, see what information they've got on you. See that people like Cambridge Analytica that buy all the information from Facebook then buy and sell governments and choose who is going to rule who. What we're going to see, what we're going to watch. Yeah? But a bit of hardcore porn, eh? Bit of bestiality, that's all right. We'll leave all that on there. Makes me so angry. It makes me so angry that I want to fight for my business and I'm not allowed. I'm being prevented. That makes me angry. It makes me angry that again and again and again and again I'm being stopped, I'm being obstructed. And all I want to do is fight for my business. So, what can I do? What's a man got to do? Man's got to give up, man. Tell me what a man's got to do. Got to give up. I've got everybody telling me I can't do it. I've got, ev I've got everything at the moment, it seems, against me. I've got circumstance. I've got virus. I've got banks. I've got government. I've got customers. I've got, I've got everybody telling me at the moment I can't do it. I've got to give up. I've got to give up. I want to carry on. I don't want to give up. I want to fight. I'm not ready to give up. I'm not ready to lay down yet. I know I've got still some something in me. I know I can get up again. Throw another couple of punches, but... I'm being prevented. And, and, and the only two... Even though we've got work going on on Instagram and work going on on Twitter, the only two that bring in proper money, and I do not mean to diss Instagram or Twitter or Katie or Lisa's work one little bit because they work just as hard as everybody else. But traditionally, the money doesn't come in from Twitter or Instagram. It comes in from YouTube and Facebook. If it's going to come in from any of the social media, that's where it's coming from. And I'm being prevented from fighting on Facebook. I'm being prevented from trying to save my business on Facebook. So what else can I do? Um, if you've got a better idea, well, I'm ready to listen. But, you know, apart from the ideas that I get bombarded with, in my text messages, Ian, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do this? Well, you should do this, you should do that. And every idea that people that people come up with that want to bombard me with these texts, and I'm, I don't mean to dish you, I really don't, because I know that you're just, you're just trying, you know, and you just want to help, I know that. But it all comes with a cost. It all comes with work or money. I've got to pay to set something up. I've got to pay to do this. Ian, get your own coin. Why don't you get your own coin? We'll all buy the coin off you. If you get your own coin, yeah, well, that comes with a cost, three grand. You know, you've got to buy a minimum quantity. And Ian, get, get your own coin minted and we'll all buy a coin off you. Actually translates into... Go and get a coin, get three grand, spend three grand on getting it all made up and about 20 of us will buy into it. So for the gloaters and the haters and all of that, you win. I'm done. You win. I'm beat. Now you can gloat. Now you can go off and say what you want to say. Now you can go off and say, yeah, see everybody, I told you you'd lose money. Of course you can. So you might as well, eh? Out of that, that's it for today. I've taken up enough of your time. Um, I'm really sorry. And uh, we'll just have to see what happens. I'm still here, I'm not going anywhere, I'm prepared to fight, I've got no bullets, if you want to give me some bullets, I'll fight, other than that, what can I do? And in our world, 
but it's his money. So, uh, I'll speak to you again later on in the week. All right, bye for now.